first presentation, we heard the story of the Sabbath in the life of Dr. Samuel Bakayoki. And in the second message, we learned how on and through the Sabbath, we can serve God, ourselves, and others. This presentation differs from the previous two because it focuses on the most recent developments regarding the Sabbath Sunday controversy. Dr. Bakayoki has examined these developments in his recent book, The Sabbath Under Crossfire, and in the next few minutes, he will share the highlight of this research. Just a warning, this is a two-hour lecture, but don't worry about it. You'll definitely be glued to your seats for the entire time. And chances are that at the end of this presentation, you will say, Mamma mia, I can't believe that it's already over. Here's Dr. Bakayoki. In this presentation this evening, we want to examine the latest Sabbath Sunday development. The title of the presentation is The Sabbath Under Crossfire. Incidentally, this is also the title of my latest book on the Sabbath, a book where I deal with the latest Sabbath Sunday development. The Lord has used providentially this book to lead over 200 clergymen in the last two years have accepted the Sabbath after reading this study, and I get messages every week from some of these church leaders who found this uh, research very compelling. Now, by way of introduction, I'd like to mention that the lecture of this afternoon is taken from this book, and uh, the um, question of the Sabbath, folks, has been under the constant crossfire of controversy. Would you believe it? During the last five centuries, since the time of the Reformation, over 3,000 treaties have been written on the Sabbath Sunday question. If you were to come to Andrews University where I teach, you come to our library, punching the word Sabbath, you will see a listing of 1,021 titles of books and treaties published within the last 30, 40 years. Truly, we can say that the Sabbath has had no rest. There was no rest for the Sabbath. Now, the question is this, folks. Why is the Sabbath so controversial? Why is it that of all the Ten Commandments, only the Fourth Commandment, the Sabbath Commandment, has been under the constant crossfire of controversy. Why is it that there has been no controversy about the fifth, the sixth, or the first, or the second? Only the Sabbath commandment is constantly being disputed, debated. Why? What do you think is the reason? Eh? What do you think? May I share a suggestion? I think that a major reason is the fact that the Sabbath summons us to consecrate our time to God. And you know, folks, people are very touched about their time. People want to use their time to seek for pleasure, to seek for profit, not necessarily to seek for the presence and the peace of God in their life. Now, recently there have been two major developments and this is what we are going to examine this afternoon on one hand there have been unprecedented new attacks against the sabbath the sabbath is being attacked today like never before and i think many of you might be interested to know what is going on and i will in the first part of this presentation i'm going to give you an update report on who are the ones who are really attacking the Sabbath in a special way. And in the second part of our lecture this afternoon, we are going to discuss the rediscovery of the Sabbath. Because while on one hand the Sabbath is being attacked by some, on the other hand is being rediscovered by so many church leaders and religious organizations. In fact, you might be surprised this afternoon to discover that even within mainline denomination, Methodist Church, Southern Baptist Church, Pentecostal churches, Salvation Army churches, Mennonite churches, all of a sudden there is an explosive interest for the Sabbath. All of a sudden there are whole congregations moving their services from Sunday 
to Saturday. That I started dreaming while I was still a teenager, 14, 15, 16 years of age. I started dreaming that someday, I said, if the Lord is going to give me this opportunity, I want to investigate which is God's holy day and what it should mean to our Christian life today. I felt that if I had to suffer, I wanted to be sure that I was suffering for the sake of biblical truth. Not for the sake of a denominational tradition. And I'm pleased to report to you this afternoon that my dream came true in a providential way. In July 1977, when I stood inside the Vatican Press watching my doctoral dissertation from Sabbath to Sunday, rolling off the Vatican Press with the official stem of the Vatican, the papal tiara and the cross key, as you see there, and the official Catholic him primato. You know, folks, this is the first and only book that has ever been published by the Vatican with their official stamp of approval, though written by a non-Catholic. And you are going to hear in a moment that the Vatican has regretted the day they allowed this to happen and they have taken certain measures in order to remedy the problem that this book is creating. Because in many of these Catholic countries in Central and South America, Catholic leaders have been fuming. They cannot understand how in the world such a thing could ever happen for a Protestant, a Seventh-day Adventist, to enter, study, research, publish the Sabbath inside the Vatican, and also receive an award. Now, this is the professor, Vincenzo Monachino, who was largely responsible for making this to happen. He's a godly man, a man of a high intellectual stature. He knew that I was a Seventh-day Adventist. He knew the risk that he was taking when he accepted to guide me through my research on the change from Sabbath to Sunday. But God gave him the courage to take such a risk. And I regret to say that he has been suffering for me until his death about a year ago because of all of his helpfulness to me. Well, I did receive at that time a gold medal from Pope Paul VI for the summa cum laude distinction, which represents 97% GPA in my classwork and the research which I did at the Vatican. This is the front sides of the medal, which shows the picture of the Pope, and it gives the year of his pontificate as the eighth year. And on the other side, there is um, portrayed a shepherd with the lamb and the flock and the new Jerusalem. The idea is that the Pope is the great shepherd of the flock, leading God's people to the city of God. By the way, this is a nice piece of gold. It's worth about um, $3,000. You know, it's a nice... I used to carry the real medal, but once when I was in Nashville, Tennessee, I passed it out, and for over an hour would not come back to me. And I started getting palpitation. I thought that somebody had run away with my gold medal. Finally, I got it back. But I said, never again, I'm going to get palpitation. I'm just going to have a good picture of it, and that will do. And I tell you, I view this gold medal not as a personal triumph, but as the triumph of truth, the triumph of our mission today to proclaim the good news of the Sabbath to our tension-filled and restless society. And I also received... Uh, a special diploma that I showed you uh, on the first lecture. Now, all of this has generated a lot of controversy, particularly in dominant Catholic countries of Central and South America. And as a result, the Vatican has taken three steps, three measures. First of all, they have removed from circulation all the copies of my book from Sabbath to Sunday. I used to sent to them on a regular basis a supply of this book. They distribute thousands of copies in all the Catholic bookstores around the world. But once they received all of this complaint from Catholic leaders and Catholic scholars from these uh, countries of Argentina, Venezuela, Puerto Rico, and uh, Uruguay, Spain, and so forth, 
they decided to resolve the problem by confiscating the book, removing from circulation. So fortunately, God gave me the foresight. Folks, I could smell smoke. You know what I mean? I could tell that sooner or later there might be problems. And you know what I did? Sooner rather than later, I went to Rome. I negotiated buying the copyright. I asked them, how much do you want me to pay for me to have the right to reprint my dissertation in America? Well, they calculated the cost. They told me they had invested $5,000 for this project and they wanted to be reimbursed if I wanted to reprint my dissertation on my own. So I paid the $5,000 and I'm glad I did it. Had they not done it, they would have control over the book and I would not be able to reprint it. But since that time, it has been reprinted about 16 times, you know, and thousands of people around the world have accepted the Sabbath after reading this. Secondly, they have told my professor, I showed you the picture before, never to have any more contact with me. He was my dear friend. He really liked me because I assisted him. I was a kind of a professor assistant. I distributed all the syllabi, collected all the money, went up to his room every day, brought all the material up there, and whenever I went to Rome after my graduation, I always paid a special visit to him. I always brought him a little gift from America. One year a leather briefcase, one year a nice, one year a nice watch, one year a golden pen. I always wanted him to know that I really appreciated all what he did for me. But once all this uh, uh, criticism, all of this condemnation start coming in from Central and South American Catholic country, this professor, Vincenzo Monachino, was instructed by the general of the Jesuit order never to have any more contact with me. And so I went there on numerous occasions at the Gregorian, as we call it, the university there. At the reception desk, I would ask, you know, the receptionist if I could speak with uh, Professor Monachino. They would ring him up, and he would tell them, no, it would not be possible for me to speak with him. I would ask for a reason, no reason would be given. I would ask for an appointment another time, no appointment could be given. Would you believe it? I was in Rome in September of last year, visiting my mother and also the meeting some speaking engagement. And I checked about my professor. I was told that he was in a critical care unit at the hospital. I thought that in that particular situation, they may allow me to see my professor. But again, I was told that I had no permission to visit him. So even on his death day, they would not allow me to see him. And that really goes to show how restrictive they can be. And lastly, the door of the Gregoriana closed. You see, it opened at Vatican II, at the Second Vatican Council that was held in Rome where from 62 to 65, when the decision was made for the first time in Catholic history to open their pontifical university to non-Catholic. By the way, we used to be called heretics. Today they call us separated brethren. That sounds much better. Don't you think so? I remember telling my friends, my classmates there at the Gregorian, I'm so happy. I'm not a heretic anymore. I'm a separated brother. And how can we be separated in Jesus Christ? Well, I was the first one to apply after the provision was made for the separated brethren to attend them. And I was also the last one. I was in Rome last year, and the pastor of our church there in Rome said, Samuel, you spoiled me for us. No, they don't want to accept anybody. Since I tried, but they told me, no way they will accept another non-Catholic. So I really want to thank God for opening the door for me to enter, study, research, and find revealing documents, documents that I want to share with you tomorrow morning. Now, when I was there in Chicago recently, I was surprised to see that there were some medical, two medical doctors finally 
they flew in from Dayton, Ohio, to Chicago to hear this lecture because I had, they heard they, were, they are receiving my newsletter, the anti-mission newsletter. They heard I was giving a special lecture on the discovery that I made in the Vatican archive, and they decided to fly, to fl fly from Dayton, Ohio, uh, to Chicago. Now, tomorrow morning, you don't have to fly. Most of you only have to ride about half an hour to come here. And I want you to understand this is going to be a very, very informative lecture. And I want to thank God for opening the door so that I could have access to the archives and find those documents that give substantiation, support to our belief on the role of the papers in changing the Sabbath to Sunday in early Christianity. Now, we like to spend some time this afternoon to discuss, first of all, the latest attacks against the Sabbath. Who are the ones who are attacking the Sabbath today? First of all is the Pope himself. You are going to hear in a moment that po the present Pope, John Paul II, in a very subtle and deceptive way, is indeed attacking the Sabbath. Secondly, there are Catholic and Protestant scholars who have produced over 30 doctoral dissertations, dissertations where they support one another in trying to legitimize Sunday observance. I'm reminded of the statement of Ellen White where she speaks about the stretching of the hands across the gulf. Are you aware of that statement where she said that Protestantism will stretch the hands across the gulf toward uh, Catholicism? And this is what is happening today in an unprecedented way. It's beautiful, beautiful. It's uh, was a revealing to see, I should say, how Protestant scholars support Catholic scholars and vice versa in their attempt to make Sancti Observance a biblical and apostolic institution. But lastly, the Sabbath is being attacked today for the very first time in the history of Christianity by former Sabbatarian. And you are going to hear about each one of them. This is the first time in the history of Christianity that the Sabbath is being attacked by those who in the past have been the champion of Sabbath keeping. But we were warned about that. Some of you might remember that Ellen White a century ago predicted that some of the bitter enemies, some of the most vicious attacks, against the Sabbath will come from our former brethren. Let me give you a report about each one of them. First of all, about Pope John Paul II. He's attacking the Sabbath in a very subtle and deceptive way. You know what he did? On May 31st, 1998, the Pope issued a pastoral letter, Dies Domini, the Lord's Day, where he makes a passionate plea for a revival of Sunday keeping, by making Sunday the biblical Sabbath. Now, when I wrote this, um, uh, when I read this document, it's a 50-page plus document, you know, first of all, I was surprised. I was surprised because in the first part of the document, the Pope praises the Sabbath in a most eloquent way as a sacred architecture of time. That is the phrase that he uses. He says that... Um, the Sabbath reveals the unfolding of the plan of salvation from perfect creation to complete redemption to final restoration. When I read, read the first seven pages of this document, I said, Mamma mia, is the Pope becoming a Sabbatarian? I thought that, you know, he was speaking so eloquently about the Sabbath, articulating so beautifully the theology of the Sabbath. I almost felt for a moment that he may have embraced the Sabbath after reading two of my books. Let me tell you what happened. Um, <laughs> We had one of our general conference leaders. Some of you may have heard of Dr. Beverly Beach, B.B. Beach from the general conference. He has been for many years the um, religious liberty uh, director as well as the interchurch director. He was in Rome some time ago at the head of a delegation of famine relief organization. He had a private audience with the Pope and he gave to the Pope these two books of mine. My dissertation on the change of the Sabbath and divine rest on the theology of the Sabbath. And would you believe it? We received a nice letter from the private secretary of the Pope saying that the Holy Father was reading with great benefit 
interest and profit, the research of San Bacchucci. Say, wow, he must have really benefited from it because he speaks so well about this now. I was almost ready to go to Rome and, uh, and see if I could arrange for a special audience and extend the right hand of fellowship uh, to the Pope, to the Adventist Church, because I felt that he, you know, deserved to be an honorary member of our church after all the good things he had to say about the Sabbath. But my joy soon turned into sorrow. Why? Because I found that on the other hand, and the Pope proclaims Sunday to be the biblical Sabbath. What he does, he takes all what the Bible says about the Sabbath and applies it to Sunday. Let me give you an example. He writes, for example, in paragraph 14 of this pastoral letter, D.S. Domini, Sunday is the day of rest because it is the day blessed by God, made holy by Him, set apart from the other day, to be among them the Lord's day. Have you ever read that in your Bible? Did you ever read in your Bible that God blessed the first day of the week, Sunday, that He made it holy? Obviously, that is what the Bible says about the Sabbath. But you know what the Pope is doing? He's applying to Sunday all those biblical statements which are descriptive of the Sabbath. And this is contrary to the historical Catholic position because Historically, the Catholic Church never claimed that Sunday is the biblical Sabbath. For example, Thomas Aquinas, the greatest Catholic theologian, he is to the Catholic Church what Ellen White is to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. What does he say? He says, in the new law, the observance of the Lord's Day took the place of the observance of the Sabbath, not by virtue of the Sabbath commandment, but by the institution of the church. This is what the Catholic Church has always openly admitted. We, the Catholic Church, have been responsible for changing the Sabbath to Sunday in early Christianity. Are you aware with some of those uh, statements in the older Catholic catechism where the question is asked, why do we observe Sunday rather than Saturday? Do you remember what the historical answer has been? We observe Sunday rather than Saturday because the Roman Catholic Church, by virtue of her authority, has transferred the solemnity of the Sabbath to Sunday. Have you heard that before? You heard that. You remember reading that. Now, this has been the historical Catholic position. We, the Catholic Church, did it. And sometimes the Catholic authority refer to it as a sign of their authority. You should read, for example, the famous disputation between Luther and Professor Eck sent by the Pope to debate Luther. And you will find that Professor Eck challenges Luther to abide by the principle of sola scriptura, only scripture, by observing the Sabbath rather than Sunday, because after all, Sunday is a Catholic institution, is an ecclesiastical institution. Well, Luther had a very, very uh, unsatisfactory answer. He said that for him didn't make any difference, because he felt that under the new covenant, Christians don't really need to worry about uh, observing a specific day. As long as they go to church for one hour, he said they could come to church on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Now the tradition has been for them to come to Sunday. We accept that, but that's not a big issue for Luther. This is the new covenant theology, which has been embraced by so many today. We are going to discuss it a bit later. But what I'm trying to point out is that today the Catholic Church is changing, adopting a new explanation. Sunday observance is no longer a Catholic, but is a biblical institution rooted and grounded according to their claim in the Sabbath commandment. Now the question is, why does Pope John Paul II want to make Sunday the biblical Sabbath? Why? Shall I tell you why? This picture gives you the answer. It is Sunday morning during summertime, and the vast majority of the people are on the beach sunbathing. 
rather than attending the Sunday Mass. This is a real problem. The Pope talks about it in the very opening paragraphs of his pastoral letter. He's very concerned about the decline in church attendance. Did you know, folks, that in Catholic countries like Italy, Spain, Central and South America, you know, in all of these countries, only about 5% of the Catholic go to church regularly on Sunday. 95% go to church three times when they are hatched, matched, dispatched. You know what that means? <laughs> Baptized, married, and buried. Those are the three trips they make to church. And the Pope is worried about it. The Pope is very concerned about the crisis of Sunday observance. Do you know why? Because he understands that the essence of Christianity is a relationship with God. And if a Christian, Catholic or Protestant, ignores the Lord, on the day which they call the Lord's Day. Such people ultimately will ignore the Lord on any other day. So basically what the Pope says, that this, uh, this crisis of the Lord's Day is the crisis of Christianity itself. And if a solution is not found soon and quickly, it can spell the doom. Not only to the Catholic Church, but to Christian to as a whole. That's why practically every Sunday now, in his homily that he delivered, he has always a special appeal to a revival of Sunday keeping. Basically, the Pope wants to resolve the crisis of the Lord's Day by making Sunday keeping no longer an ecclesiastical Catholic institution, but a biblical, moral, imperative rooted and grounded in the Sabbath commandment. Now, I have examined the Pope's letter at great length in my book, The Sabbath Under Crossfire. In fact, the first chapter of my book, over 55 pages, is devoted to an in-depth analysis. Would you believe it? I spent a couple of months reading those 50-page documents because, you know, those documents are very well crafted. A superficial reading doesn't tell you everything, doesn't give you the whole story. Sometimes you have to read between the lines to try to figure out what are all the implications of those statements. And I'm pleased to tell you that the public media has taken notice of this analysis. Would you believe it? Some of the major newspapers like Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, Detroit Press have published lengthy reports. And in this particular article from Washington Post, you might be able to see the picture of the Pope next to mine. I'm in good company there, don't you think so? And the editor of the newspaper, Bill Broadway, he interviewed me for three solid hours. And then what did he do? He sent FedEx at my house to get all my Sabbath books. He wanted to have them on his desk by next morning, 10 o'clock. And he wrote a very good article. In the article, he basically accepts my observation that what the Pope is doing today in trying to make Sunday the biblical Sabbath is unfair. In fact, the subtitle is what? Adventist says Pope unfairly promotes Sunday Sabbath. And I want you to understand that this papal strategy to make Sunday the biblical Sabbath has two major problems. One is a biblical problem, obviously, because Sunday is not the Sabbath. The two days have a different origin, different meaning, different authority, different experience. And secondly, there is a legal problem because the Sunday legislation that the Pope promotes, in fact, he appeals to the international community of nations to promulgate the Sunday legislation to ensure that Catholics have the right to observe their Sunday. This appeal for an international Sunday legislation obviously creates serious legal problems because it discriminates against minorities like you and I who observe a different day of the week. Now, I'd like to discuss for a moment the biblical problem and then the legal and social problem. From a biblical perspective, the New Testament does not view the Sunday resurrection of Jesus Christ as a full extension and embodiment of the Sabbath as the Pope is claiming. A careful study of the New Testament shows 
that the resurrection in the New Testament is important. Yes, no question about it. Do you remember what Paul said? If Jesus is not risen, our faith is in vain, our hope is in vain, our preaching is in vain, we are the most miserable people on the face of the earth. The resurrection is important in the New Testament, but is always understood as an existential reality, not as a liturgical practice. There is no indication in the New Testament, there is no suggestion, no command to celebrate the resurrection on a weekly Sunday or annual Easter Sunday. If you notice there, and we are going to discuss it tomorrow morning. In the last presentation, we are going to ex ex examine this whole claim of the resurrection, and you are going to see that the emphasis of the, of the New Testament is on the power of the resurrection. Paul himself in Philippians 3.10 he prays that I may know the power of the resurrection, not the day of the resurrection. In fact, would you be interested to know that the phrase day of the resurrection is nowhere to be found in the New Testament. It's nowhere to be found in early Christian literature. We have to wait until the 4th century. The writing of Eusebius of Caesarea, the one who is known as the father of church history, he's the first one in 325 to, in his commentary on the book of Psalms, Psalm 91, this is the day that the Lord has made, where he refers to that day as being the day of the resurrection. In the New Testament and in the early Christian literature, the, the day of Christ's resurrection is never denominated, designated as such. I want you to notice, fellow believers and friends, that if Jesus wanted to make the day of his resurrection a memorial day, don't you think that he would have done something about it? Think about it for a moment. If Jesus wanted to make the day of his resurrection a memorial day, don't you think that when he appeared to the women first, to the disciples later, he would have told them, come apart, let us celebrate my resurrection. Did you notice that all these biblical institutions, such as the Sabbath, Baptism, Lord's Supper, foot washing, all of them trace their origin to a divine act that established them. Isn't it true? And don't you think that if Jesus wanted the day of his resurrection to become a memorial day, to be celebrated, to be memorialized, wouldn't he have done something about it? But when you read all the utterances of the risen Savior, what do you find? He told to the women to go to Galilee. He told to the disciples, go teach, baptize. All the utterances of the risen Savior presuppose work rather than rest and worship. I want you to notice, folks, that in the New Testament, the resurrection of Jesus is actually celebrated through baptism, not through Sunday keeping. We are told that when we are baptized symbolically, we are buried with Christ. We are risen with Christ. So, in other words, baptism rather than, the, uh, than Sunday keeping help us to memorialize the resurrection of Jesus. Now, there is also a legal and social problem because um, legally, as I told you a moment ago, Sunday laws discriminate against minority who observe different days of rest and worship. The United States, for example, if it was to promulgate Sunday laws to be fair to minority, they would also have to promulgate Saturday laws for the Sabbatarian or perhaps Friday laws for the Muslim. Obviously, this kind of uh, legislation would be very disruptive to the socio-economical system of this country or of any country. But there is also a social problem. You know, folks, Sunday laws have proven to be a failure. In Europe, where I come from, we have Sunday laws. In Italy, for example, everything is shut down on Sunday. It's not like in America. You, American, work hard during the week to make the money, and you wait for the weekend to spend it. Isn't it true? All the shopping malls are open on Sunday. You don't find that in, in Italy, in France, in Germany. I discovered that to my regret when I was driving there from uh, 
from Venice, where my wife is from, to Hamburg. We tank up on Saturday night, but as we was a long stretch, and then on the autobahn we started noticing that we were running lower and lower on gas. I stopped at one gasoline station a second, and they were all closed on Sunday. <gasps> Mamma mia, what are we going to do now? You know what I had to do? I had to stop in a rest area, and I canvassed 20 German cars to find if any of them had some gasoline to sell to me so that we could reach our destination. And the, the 20th car, finally I found a guy that spoke a little bit of English. He had one of those army tanks, you know, with five gallons of fuel, and I bought it. I even gave him extra money to thank him for the graciousness of selling me some gas on Sunday. So keep that in mind. If you are traveling through Europe, we want to be sure that uh, you make adequate provision because chances are you may not even be able to find gas on Sunday. Does this mean that more people go to church? Absolutely not. The contrary is true. Church attendance in Europe is less than 10%. In fact, many of these great cathedrals there in Europe, they are monuments to a faith that once may have been superstitious, yes, but was alive, but today is dead. Many of those great cathedrals have become only tourist attractions, and in some cases, warehouses. Would you believe that in London, where I'm going to be in about a month's time, I will be spending a whole ten days speaking to our three, in our three largest churches in London, Brixton, Stamborough Park, and Croydon. And you know that some of our big churches in London were donated to us by the Queen, they were leased to us by the crown for one British pound. How much is that? One dollar forty nowadays. It has been going down, by the way. For one dollar forty, we got multi-million dollars cathedral for a period of 99 years. That was a bargain. Don't you think so? Don't you think it would be nice if in America we could get beautiful cathedrals for a couple of dollars for 99 years? Why did they give them to us? Not because they were really generous, or, but because they were going to disrepute. They were, no, they were shut down. They were closed. It would have cost too much to repair. And rather than seeing such a beautiful monument like the church in Brixton, where I will be preaching on April 21st, you can see 3,000 people, beautiful cathedral. Look forward to preaching that cathedral, I tell you. But uh, uh, it, there was nobody going to church. And so rather than seeing them destroyed or abandoned, they have given them to us. That is a different part of the country. This is the sad reality. Folks, that is a sign of the end. You know, Jesus said that on one hand, the gospel of the kingdom would reach the whole world. And this is what is happening today in an unprecedented way. For the first time today, Christianity has become a global religion. Did you know that at the turn of the century, in 1900, Christianity was still the religion of the white man? Did you know that 85% of the Christians were Caucasian in, in 1900? 97% of the Adventists were Caucasian. What about today? You, would you believe it that today we have in our own church 92% of the Adventists are in developing country. Caucasians have become an engendered species in the Adventist church. Did you know that? You know that, were you there at, um, at the general conference session in Toronto? Anyone was there? Anyone? I can see a few hands, you were there. Did you notice on Sabbath morning as I walked out from the dome, I was surrounded by a sea of people, all races, all colors, but I was looking for the, for the Caucasian, the white people, and I said, where are they? I became aware that we are becoming an engendered species. That was part of Christ's prediction, that the gospel would reach the world. At the turn of the century, Christianity was still the religion of the white man. But today, we are reaching every tribe, kindred, and people. But while Christianity is reaching the ends of the world, those Christian countries like, the, like Northern Europe, like Germany, that was the heartland, of the Reformation, 
are becoming pagan country. Less than 6 or 7% of the Christians go to church. This is indeed one of the challenges we are facing today. But, and what I'm trying to say is that in this country, some laws have lost their punch, have lost their function. They are not really encouraging people to go to church on Sunday. So what is the solution to the problem? I believe that the solution to the problem is not legislation, is not the promotion of international Sunday legislation by the international community of nations, but is moral, spiritual renovation. I believe that what the Pope should be doing, he should call upon Christians everywhere to remember what they have long forgotten, to remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. And I believe that what the Pope should be doing should help people understand what does it mean to remember the Sabbath day. It's not just going to church for half an hour, you know, to fulfill the mass precept, and if you cannot do it on Sunday morning, try to do it on Saturday afternoon, because as I told you this morning and last night, in the first uh, uh, previous three presentations, now they are anticipating, both Catholic and Protestant, they are anticipating the Sunday services to Saturday afternoon or evening to accommodate those who cannot make it to church on Sunday. By the way, I was just reading a book recently entitled The Future of the Christian Sunday by Christopher Kisling. He argues that the, the Saturday afternoon and evening religious services are not sufficient anymore. Why? Because most people have already left by Friday. Most people that take off for the weekend, they leave on Friday afternoon, not on Saturday afternoon. So he proposed is what, we, what he called the fluctuating hour of worship. That is, if a family or a couple or someone knows that he's going to be away for the weekend, they can arrange to have a special gospel breakfast meeting on Wednesday morning, Tuesday night, tell the family member, tell the office worker, you know, we are going to be away for the weekend. So why don't we have a little uh, uh, service now? So we can tell to the Lord that if he don't see us in church next Sunday or Saturday afternoon, he should not get upset with us because we took care of him on Wednesday morning or on Tuesday night. That may sound very strange, but this is on the offing, it's on the planning, because basically people have come to view the Lord's Day, as I told you this in the previous presentation, not as a day, but as an hour, and they want even the hour of worship to be fluctuating during the week. But I believe the challenge of the Pope is to help the Christian world understand that the essence of God's holy day is not just going to church for half an hour at a convenient time, but giving priority to God for 24 hours during the seventh day. Now, the Sabbath is also being attacked today by Catholic and Protestant scholars who have produced over 30 doctoral dissertations. It's amazing. I spent over a thousand dollars buying all of these dissertations in Germany, in France, Spain, United States. As I started reading the literature, you know, I couldn't believe just about in all the major countries there are doctoral dissertations dealing with the Sabbath Sunday question. And you will find if you read this scholarly literature, there is a common effort, a common endeavor to legitimize Sunday observance as a biblical institution. Perhaps the most influential work, the most scholarly work, is this symposium from Sabbath to the Lord's Day, which has been produced by seven British American scholars. They work together over a period of several years in Cambridge University in England, and it was a combined doctoral project. It is largely a response to my dissertation. You can tell it by the title. My dissertation is entitled From Sabbath to Sunday, and this is entitled From Sabbath to the Lord's Day. In fact, um, they acknowledge right there in the introduction on page 15, they say, without doubt, the work that has stirred up the greatest interest is that of Sam Bakyuki. They devote a whole page to me, and um, they praise my work in many ways, but they also express reservation in other places. And among the index of author, after my name, you can see about 100 page references, which indicates that they refer to my work over 100 times, sometimes approvingly, sometimes disapprovingly. Now, these people are trying to argue 
that their major argument is that Christ terminated at the cross the Old Testament function of the Sabbath by becoming our Sabbath rest. And so New Testament Christians do not need to rest physically on the seventh day because they can experience the rest of salvation every day. So they celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the first day of the week. Now, the major flaw of this uh, um, uh, scholarly symposium is the failure to recognize that Christ did not nullify but clarify the Sabbath. I want you to notice that, uh, that Christ never accepted the accusation of having broken the Sabbath. You remember he was often involved in the Sabbath controversy, but never Jesus accepted the charge of being a Sabbath breaker. He appealed to the Scripture. You remember what you, Haven't you read? Don't you know what the Bible says? Don't you know what the priests do on the Sabbath? If the priests can work uh, intensively on the Sabbath, then this is what we preachers do. <laughs> like today is going to be a busy day for me. It's not a rest day. But Jesus says they are guiltless. Why? Why are we guiltless? Because the work that is being done by the minister, by the pastor, by the priest is not a mercenary, but it's a mission. It's a redemptive activity, helping people to experience, you know, the blessing of salvation. Yes, in the New Testament, folks, there is no command. Uh, regarding the observance of a weekly Sunday or an annual Easter Sunday to honor the resurrection of Jesus. We are going to come back to this uh, attack by Catholic and Protestant scholars in conjunction with the third attack today by former Sabbatarians. Folks, let me tell you something. This is the first time in the history of Christianity where the Sabbath is being attacked by those who in the past have been the champion of Sabbath keeping. You know, I'm a church historian by training and profession. My doctoral degree is in, in the history of Christianity, the early church, and this is the subject I have taught for the last 35 years. And I want you to know that never again in the history of Christianity, never before in the history of Christianity, the Sabbath has been attacked by those who have been the promoter, the proclaimer, the champion of Sabbath keeping. Who are those who are attacking the Sabbath? First of all, the leaders of the worldwide Church of God. I'm sure that you are aware of the fact that about six years ago, early in 95, January 1995, the president of the Worldwide Church of God, they refer to him as Pastor General Joseph Tekach Jr. with the help of his associate, produced a 22-page document entitled The Sabbath, where he proclaimed the Sabbath to be part of the old covenant given to the Jews, nailed to the cross, no longer binding upon us Christians today. And you know, that document was sent out to all the ministers, to all the pastors around the world, to the worldwide Church of God, and it had an explosive effect. In a matter of few weeks, 70,000 people left the church. And over this period of time, over 75% of the members left the church. A church that had 200,000 members today is left with, over, with only about 30 thousand members. By the way, he was supposed to come to meet with me at Andrews University. He had uh, accepted the invitation to come and discuss this old New Covenant theology. We had fixed the date in 95 for April 29th. But as we came closer to the date, he got cold feet after reading my analysis of that document, which I posted on the internet. So he cancelled the out. And this meeting never took place. But let me assure you, I received many, many invitations from uh, uh, many of these dear people who were so badly shaken by this document. I would say that I've been out for almost 25 weekends across this country, overseas, to meet with these dear people that were confused, were shaken, were looking for help. In Sydney, Australia, we had a Sabbath conference sponsored by these dear people. You wouldn't believe it. The place was packed. The convention center was full. Some of the people that wanted to fly in from New Zealand, from, uh, what is it there, um, uh, Tasmania, 
from Perth, they were told not to come because there was no place. And you should have heard some of the story. Some of these people really were deeply hurt. I remember this man who flew in from Perth, 2,000 miles to come to the convention. He said, Dr. Bakyoki, you wouldn't believe it. I have been a seven-day Sabbath keeper for 30 years. The Sabbath has never been an issue in my life. I would have never dreamed that I would fly across the country to come to a Sabbath conference and pay $50 of registration. That's what they had to pay, not for me, but to cover all the costs, you know, of this uh, organizing this convention. But he said, when your faith is shaken and your family is splitting, you look for all the help that you can get. His wife wanted to stay with the worldwide and abandon the Sabbath. He wasn't prepared to do that. That's why he came. You know, we are reminded that the Sabbath is going to become a test in truth. And for some of these dear people, the Sabbath has become a test in truth. But the Sabbath is also being attacked today by former Adventist Bible teachers and pastors. Would you believe it? Within the last five years, we lost over 15 pastor and Bible teacher that I know of. And everybody's giving me a new name and new information. Even your dear pastor, Bolin was telling me last night about a young man whom they had introduced to the message, very promising young fellow. He went to the seminary and he lost his way. And if I remember correctly, Pastor Bowling, I think you mentioned that today he's serving in the church of the disciples of Christ. Every weekend I learn about some of our Bible teachers and pastors who have resigned you know, from our church and are writing books against the Sabbath. In fact, I have spent almost two months lately responding to this 42-page document of Pastor Greg Taylor from the North Carolina Conference, from the Carolina Conference. There is no North Carolina. It's all one conference. He was the pastor there in Asheville, North Carolina, the Foster Memorial Seventh-day Adventist Church with over 500 members. He wrote an open letter on July 1 of last year where he set out his reason from resigning from the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and 90% of the letter sets out his reason for rejecting the Sabbath. And I've been asked to respond to it. In fact, I was over there, invited to speak to the pastor and to rally of several churches. This is what is going on today. Perhaps the most influential book that has, uh, what shall I say, caused many of these ministers and Bible teachers and over 50,000 Seventh-day Adventists to leave the church in the last five years is this book entitled The Sabbath in Crisis, written by Dale Ratzloff, who he was an Adventist Bible teacher for nine years at Monterey Bay Academy in California, and he was also a pastor there in the conference. And in this book of 345 pages, he sets out his reason of why he has rejected the Sabbath. And um, I have examined this book very closely, together with all this literature, and my book, The Sabbath Under Crossfire, to which I referred earlier, is largely a response to all of these latest attacks against the Sabbath. Now, they also have started a... Um, magazine. It's called Proclamation. He called me a few days ago asking me if I would contribute an article on the covenants uh, for this proclamation. They print 20,000 of them, send them out every month to all the Adventist thought leaders. And I got my latest issue just this past week. I told the rats of, listen, why are you asking me to write an article? You know that I responded to your New Covenant theology in my book. I devoted a chapter to it. I have already exposed all the fallacies of, the, of your reasoning. Why do you want me to do again? By the way, I said, why don't you do me a favor? Why don't you change the title, the name of your magazine? Why don't you call it provocation rather than proclamation? Because after all, that's what you are trying to do. You are trying to provoke the Adventists to anger by attacking their fundamental beliefs. Now, 
I was invited to debate him at the Christian radio station in St. Louis. The director of the KJSL invited me to debate him on uh, June 15, 1998. He had given three uh, radio talk shows attacking the Sabbath. And somebody called up the director of the station said, why don't you give a chance to a Sabbatarian to respond? And they thought that would be fair. So they called me up and they asked me if I would be willing to debate him because several others turned down the invitation. And uh, we had an animated debate, by the way. They gave us one hour, but we were interrupted a number of times by some of these advertisements. And uh, I wanted to give him the knockout, but they didn't give me the chance to finish the job. They would only give me one minute to respond. And what can you do in one minute? I've been trained by Jesuit to overkill rather than to live half dead. And in one minute, you cannot finish the job. So I told they listen, if you are serious about it, why don't we continue the dialogue on the Internet? So what I did, I went through the book, the 12th chapter, I examined each one of them, and I exposed what I consider to be the major flaws, the fallacies, and he responded, and I post his response. In a matter of few weeks, I had over 10,000 people that signed up for these uh, exchanges, for this debate. And this is how the End Time Issue newsletter began. How many of you received my End Time Issue newsletter? I can see a number of hands. Look at that. I wouldn't be surprised if there are many more in this congregation who have internet service. How many of you have internet service? Could I see that? Many more hands. Well, I have good news for you. If you are a person with an inquiring mind that likes to be, keep updated on all of this latest development, in a moment I'm going to tell you how you also can sign up for this end time mission newsletter. It's a complete free service. I used to post one every couple of weeks, but my time has been so limited lately, so I'm only posting one every three, four weeks, but each letter is a major, major document. For example, the number 79 was my response to Dr. James Kennedy. Have you ever heard of Dr. James Kennedy? He's a popular preacher from Coral Ridge, Florida. Recently, he preached a sermon on the Sabbath, the gift of rest. Good sermon, a lot of profound insights. But unfortunately, in that sermon, he, first of all, uh, uh, criticizes, you know, our own Adventist church and position, and then he presents a number of uh, arguments uh, for the biblical legitimacy of Sunday observance, which indeed lack biblical and historical foundation. And many people that listen to him ask me, because he's such an influential preacher in America today, if I would respond. I spent 150 hours preparing a response. I posted on the Internet this open letter, and I sent a copy to him about a month ago. And I was wondering what would happen. I sent together with the letter the four books on the Sabbath I have authored, and I called a month ago to find out if they received it. I spoke with his private secretary, Mary Ann is her name. She said, yes, Dr. Kennedy has received it. Your package is right there on his desk. And when he comes back from out of town, he plans to delve into it. Well, I received a letter also confirming it, but I have not received a call from Dr. Kennedy yet, nor a personal letter. So what did I do? On Wednesday, this last Wednesday, I called him up. I called up his office because I have the direct number to his office and to his secretary. And I spoke with Mary Ann, his private secretary, to find out what has happened. I said, Mary Ann, do you know anything if Dr. Kennedy ever had the chance to read my, my 42-page open letter? It's a lengthy document, by the way. And my books... Well, didn't he answer you? I thought you had already received an answer. No, I have not. Let me go and get the folder. So she went to the office, 
pulled out the folder and he opened it up. He said, you know what? He has answered another doctor who was asking if he had responded to my open letter which I sent to him. So he says he has already prepared the response, but it's, it's a response about your document, but it has been sent to somebody else, and I know that he's working on a response for you. He said, but you know, you have written such a lengthy document. Give him some time to prepare an answer. No problem, no problem. I just wanted to know if he's uh, reading it. And I said, you know, I'm going to be there in Dallas on the weekend of May the 4th. And if it was possible to have a visit with Dr. Kennedy, I would love it. And she said, oh, I'm sure that we might be able to arrange it. Let me work at it and I'll get back to you. So this is very interesting, isn't it? Now, we had a very animated discussion with, doc, uh, with this Dave Ratzlaff. Let me tell you what is the major problem. The major problem which I found in the book and in the debate is what I, cons- uh, what I call the cafeteria method of biblical interpretation. What Dale does, he takes certain Bible texts that support his view, but ignores those which negate his view. Let me give you an example. He takes those Pauline passages where Paul speaks negative about the law. Romans 3.28, we are saved by grace through faith without the works of the law. But he ignores the other Pauline passages which speaks positive about the law. Like, for example, 1 Corinthians 7.19, circumcision and uncircumcision count nothing but the keeping of God's commandment. Romans 8.4, God said his son in the likeness of sinful flesh so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who live not according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Now a responsible Bible student cannot use the cafeteria method. In the cafeteria method when you go to the cafeteria if you don't like the broccoli you don't take them you leave them there. But when you come to the study of the Bible you have to eat the broccoli as well. You have to examine I mean, even those Bible, even those Bible passages that may not be supportive of your view. And you know what I found? If a person takes a bit of time to scratch his head, and this is what I have done for many years, that's why everything is shiny, because I've been scratching a little bit too much. If a person takes a little bit of time to scratch his head, what do you really find? I found, for example, that when Paul speaks negative about the law, is because he's speaking about the law in the context of salvation, soteriologically, as we say. And Paul basically say that we are not saved by the law. We are not saved by rules and regulation. We are saved by the atoning sacrifice of Christ. Isn't it true? But when Paul speaks affirmatively, positively about the law, he speaks about it in the context of the ethical, moral standard of salvation. When we are saved, we are not saved to live in sin, but to live according to the principle that God has revealed us. You follow me? So there is an explanation for this apparent contradiction between the negation and affirmation of the law. Paul negates the law as the basis of salvation, but he affirms the law as the moral standard of salvation. You follow me? And this is a problem with some of these dear people that they don't look at the whole picture. They only pick up and choose what support their cases. Now, those of you that want to receive this newsletter, I told you that I'm going to pass out a form where you can give your email. And also this morning you must have received a color flyer descriptive of my research. And there in the flyer you may have seen I have an email address and you can just send me a request and you can become my cyberspace Bible students. You know, folks, you might be interested to know that we have had even Adventist pastors that have written articles for the Sunday magazine. This is the official publication of the Lord's Day Alliance of the United States. And one of our former Adventist fellow believers, his name is Rodney Nelson, wrote an article where entitled, Why the Lord's Day Matters to Me. And right there at the introduction, what does he say? As a former Seventh-day Adventist, observance of the Sabbath was very important to me. And then he goes on setting out his four 
reasons why he has rejected the Sabbath. And I believe it would be good if we can take a few moments this afternoon to examine this new covenant theology, because sooner or later you are going to be exposed to it. I have been invited now by a number of conferences. Two weeks ago, I met with all the pastors of the Indiana Conference because two of their pastors have just resigned from the ministry and embraced this new covenant theology. So I think it's good to understand what is this theology? What are the basic fallacies? And this is what we want to examine very quickly this afternoon. The new covenant theology emphasizes the distinction between what they call the old covenant package of laws and the new covenant principle of love. They claim that the Sabbath is supposed to be part of the old covenant package of laws that was terminated, nailed to the cross. And they claim that new covenant Christians are to observe the Sabbath not by resting physically on the seventh day, but by experiencing the rest of salvation every day. Now, what are the problems with this new covenant theology? Can I mention four major flaws of this new covenant theology? The first flaw is that it creates an arbitrary distinction between the old and the new covenant, a distinction which is nowhere to be found in the Scripture. I want you to notice that in the Bible, the new covenant is already given in the Old Testament. It is the new covenant because God renewed it to His people after they came back from captivity. He renewed this covenant with them. And this new covenant is not the replacement of a package of laws with principle of love, but is the internalization of God's law. Do you remember what the prophet Jeremiah and also Ezekiel, they repeat the same thing. What do they say? This is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel. He says, I will put my law within them. I will write it upon their hearts. This is the new covenant. It's the internalization of God's law within our heart. He is observing God's law not as an imposition, not as an obligation, but as a loving response. Number two, I want you to notice that, by the way, actually this is part of number one. I want you to notice that in the Bible, law is love. There is no dichotomy between law and love. Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. And the Ten Commandments are basically principle of love. On the first table of the law, it helps us to express our love to God. The second table of the Decalogue is designed to help us express our love to fellow beings. The second flaw of this new covenant theology is that it ignores that the covenant in the Bible is God's commitment to save. That's why God is the God of the everlasting covenant, because God has only one plan of salvation. Those who would like us to believe, and these are the dispensationalists, those who have written all of this material about the rapture left behind, they are all, you know, embracing this theology. They would like us to believe that in the Old Testament, God offers salvation to the Jews by means of works, works of obedience, obedience to the law. But in the, in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, salvation is offered not by works, but by grace. It almost suggests, if that were true, if that were true, it would suggest that God tried to offer salvation by works, but when he found that works don't work, then he changed his mind. So I better make it easy for them. Why don't I offer them salvation by grace through faith? That is a, that is a, a senseless construct for because salvation has always been a divine gift of grace. When Moses went up to the mountain to receive the ten principles of life, he also received the blueprint of the tabernacle, which was God's provision of grace. I want you to notice that in the Bible, salvation is always and only through the atoning sacrifice of Christ. In the Old Testament, this atoning sacrifice of Christ was accepted typologically through the sacrificial system. In the New Testament, we accept it realistically through baptism and the Lord's Supper. The third flaw of this New Covenant theology is that it ignores 
the cosmic sweep of the Sabbath. The Sabbath embraces creation, redemption, and final restoration. The Sabbath invites us to celebrate that God has created us perfectly, that He has redeemed us completely, that He's interceding constantly, and He will restore us ultimately. In other words, the Sabbath embraces creation, redemption, final restoration. It's interesting to notice in the book of Hebrews, when it speaks of the sanctuary service, of the ceremonial law, the Levitical ministry, what it says, they are abolished, done away with, finished. You read in Hebrews 7, 8, 9, and 10. But when it comes to the Sabbath, what does it say? Hebrews 4, 9, powerful passage. It says a Sabbatismus, technical term for seven-day Sabbath keeping. It's a term only used once in the New Testament. And fortunately, it has been established even by Sunday keeping scholars who did their, uh, the, their symposium there at Cambridge University in England. They found that Sabbatismus is used in extra biblical literature and they found five usages which I was not able to find by the way in the 500 volumes of patristic literature but they found it and in all those five instances Sabbatismus is the technical term for literal physical seven day Sabbath keeping so what the book of Hebrews says that the seven day Sabbath keeping apolepetai what does it mean remains has been left behind for the people of God why? Because the Sabbath not only points back to creation, but it points forward to the rest and peace that awaits to the people of God in the world to come. And these people who are embracing and proclaiming this new covenant theology, they ignore the cosmic sweep of the Sabbath, which did not terminate at the cross, but will find its ultimate fulfillment in the world to come, when from Sabbath to Sabbath we will indeed gather to worship God. And the fourth flaw of this new covenant theology is that it ignores that it's through the physical rest that we apprehend, conceptualize, internalize the reality of the spiritual rest. In other words, they say we do not need to rest physically on the Sabbath because we can experience the rest of salvation every day. Such reasoning ignores that it's through the physical that we apprehend the spiritual. I want you to notice that in the Bible, God uses physical reality, physical elements. Why do we have the bread and wine of the Lord's Supper? Why do we have this physical element? Why not a wedding, a slice of a wedding cake? You know, because it's through this bread and wine that we conceptualize, internalize the reality of the broken body, the spilled blood for our salvation. Why do we have the water in baptism? That's physical, isn't it? Why don't we dry clean people into the church? Eh? Because it's through the physical that we apprehend the spiritual of the death burial and resurrection in the new life with Christ. So why do we have the physical Sabbath rest? It's because as Hebrew 4.10 tells us, as we cease from our work, as God sees from His work, we are able to enter into God's rest. You know, the, the, the act of stopping our work becomes a way in which we allow God to work in us more fully and more freely. Well, as you have seen this afternoon, the Sabbath is indeed attacked today by many, by the Pope, by uh, Protestant, Catholic scholars, by former Sabbatarians. But I want to close this first part of our lecture this afternoon by reassuring you that all of these attacks against the Sabbath, they have not undermined the Sabbath. I want to reassure you that the Sabbath is not in crisis. The title of the book, The Sabbath in Crisis, made me smile. Because if the Sabbath was in crisis, then God himself would be in crisis. Because after all, the Sabbath is a divine institution. God established it. And if the Sabbath is in crisis, God himself is in crisis. The Sabbath is not in crisis. The Sabbath is still valid today, valuable today, beneficial today, as it was first given and in the second part of this presentation, I'd like to share with you some good news of the church leaders, scholars, and religious organizations who are rediscovering the Sabbath today. <laughs>